I think more prods are seeing people turn towards the east and certainly use the smears as a way to put up a barrier. I think so too, yeah. And recently using shooping interviews to bolster their positions. So that's something that they do. Thoughts on shooping seems odd to me. I'll say some stuff briefly about him. He always tried to Protestantize orthodoxy, uh, even though he had like one decent book about presuppositionalism. He always, when you read his blogs and articles, I noticed this because a couple of, a couple of friends posted them to me. To kind of like, look, here's penal substitution at home in orthodoxy, and it's from shooping. Yep. And I read about it, and it's like, the arguments aren't really that good. I'm not no. really convinced, but, you know, he always tried to Protestantize orthodoxy, and so they're, they're using him as the poster boy. as like, oh, look, he was orthodox, and he became Protestant. But for, like, every shooping, there are, like, 10 opposite people, you know, going from, not 10, thousands. There's a thousand people that are moving from Protestantism to orthodoxy. So, I mean, I, I guess I'm happy that they finally found someone they can use after, like, what? Like, five, six, seven years of YouTube apologetics from various people? Cool, but that's not really impressive, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, one thing that, I guess, what's, what's sad about a lot of the online apologetic sphere, and one of the reasons I think that we have the success that we've had is that a lot of people rely on um, personal experiences, drama, uh, all of the things that are bad reasons. And a lot of people are just banking on bad reasons to to not be orthodox or to be something else. And uh, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm sure Shooping has various arguments that he makes and points that he makes. I'm not saying that he doesn't make those points, but it's like for a lot of people... Ooh, we got one, right? It's like, oh, we finally got one. Ooh, we got somebody who's not uh, hanging out with Jay and David anymore. We got him. And they think that like this is really going to be a driving factor in people uh, not becoming Orthodox or becoming Roman Catholic or Protestant or something. And these kinds of things don't, this is not ultimately what's going to decide anything. Just like talking about moral corruption, it might be relevant, but it's not going to be the ultimate reason why this or that church or religion isn't true so it and, and i mean at a certain level it's that's different depending upon the system like in roman catholic theology if we were just sitting around saying that oh well the pope is an, um, an immoral person and look how many immoral priests there are if that was our only argument right like the way lofton thinks that we argue right that would not be a very good argument it would not be enough but that's never been the point. Nobody's ever been saying that, uh, oh, well, let's find out who has less corruption. And let's find, th these are all just bad reasons. Ultimately, it's going to have to come down to which position is true or false. That's it. You're not going to determine this on the basis of who can, you know, pull up more drama on this or that online person. That's not ultimately, that's only going to work for the lowest tier people. And if you want to uh, pack your ranks with the lowest tier people, go for it. Because, But that's not going to last very long, and that's not going to give you much strength. So um, I don't think it really – ultimately, it's not going to matter. I mean, you can find people who switch religions all the time. So what if there's a guy who uh, used to be this and now he's that? Um, I mean, I've changed my position. So what? Uh, I think that, you know, when you look at what Shooping's real issues were, it's like, dude, I mean – how were you even orthodox that long and you thought that substitutionary atonement was true? Like, where were you getting your, your theology? That's like a, that's something you should have learned within like the first year or two of looking into orthodoxy. And so here this guy's about to be a priest and he still thinks penal substitution is true. I mean, this is, that's kind of embarrassing. Yeah, definitely. And one thing is kind of relevant because something that happened recently in Rokor is I guess they... I guess they instituted a new policy where for like, if a priest is go going from a different sect to orthodoxy, they're going to like make it wait for three years before they receive him as a priest because of things like this. It was something like this. And, um, and I think that's definitely, especially today, that's certainly a policy that needs to be considered at the very least because, yeah, I mean, this, this just goes to show that, you know, Proper education is, is something important. Eastern Orthodox closer to rejoining with Orientals or Roman Catholic or splitting in two. I don't say there's any chance of being there being splitting in two, but I think it's referring to Moscow schism. Um, my take is that it's rather the Orientals and Roman Catholics that are supposed to be rejoining 
the Orthodox Church. We're not the ones. We, we're not the ones that changed. We're not the ones that became a different church. It's rather the other ones. And um, I don't think there's going to be an institution institutionalized union between the Orthodox and the Roman Catholics, like on a real scale. What is really going to happen is that uh, Roman Catholics Orientals are going to come back to the true church. Though there's also the 2025 Nicaea stuff, which, um, which by the way, um, as someone who has been there, it's a very small city. I don't, I don't think it's going to house that a lot of people when, when it does happen, but if it does happen, but, um, yeah, I don't think it's, it's, it's a just real a, thing what's coming happen. in 2025 is a repeat of this, a new false Florentine union. And David, uh, covered this video several years ago. I mean, excuse me, he's covered this book several years ago. Uh, I recommend this book because you'll notice the, the, the parallels between the geopolitical pressures at that time to have this false union and the exact mirror geopolitical pressures in our day to have this false union. So that's what's going to happen in 2025. Unless this is totally unpopular, right? I mean, if, if they keep pushing for this kind of a thing and nobody buys it, they'll just wait and, uh, you know, postpone it to try to have this false union. Also, said, oh, yeah, he says, you know, starting heretics believe that Christ is two natures, two wills, two energies, two minds, which is, you know, yes, we do believe that um, because he's human and divine. Being human means you have a human will. So he has a human will and a divine will. Being human means he has human activities, which means he has two energies. Being human means he has a human mind. So there's no shame in admitting that. that what is shameful is actually thinking that our position is shameful. And his position, it leads to triteism because by that logic, mind, energy, will, all of these will be proper to the person, proper to hypostasis. There are three hypostasis in the Trinity. Therefore, there will be three wills. Well, which church father believes that? None of them, not a single one of them. It, they condemned this as heresy. So, yeah, that's all I will say to that to that nonsense. Uh, so, I appreciate the two dollars super chat or to Eric, but I guess that's that's basically how I will how I will kind of do. And I will already have a massive playlist on this issue. A lot of these people just lie. A lot of these people just cope. And a lot of these people don't even listen. They don't even read. They just make these propaganda lies and they try to agitate. But what I see is that I see a lot of people, Ethiopians, Syriacs, Copts, that actually look at the material we present, look at the arguments we present, and actually do become orthodox. I've, heard, I've seen a lot of people, particularly Ethiopians, um, some of them are even in the chat here, that actually became orthodox because they saw the same things that I am talking about right now, right? That the monophysite position on Christ is heretical because it leads to various different heresies of tritheism, to even this, even Nestorianism, as a matter of fact. It is just a different side of the coin, but it still used the same presupp theological presuppositions that Nestorius had. So I think people that are interested can check, can check that playlist, but in why it is a nonsensical position. Um, and, and so for those who don't know, we're referring to the old calendarists. They call themselves genuine Orthodox. They call themselves true Orthodox, right? So they have these various different names. They tend to not be in community with each other. So these are just different splinter groups. And the basis for their separation is initially the adoption of the new calendar. Um, they claimed this was uncanonical. The evidence that they used was the Sigillion of 1683. It turns out that was not actually a... Uh, the, the canon that they're talking about doesn't actually exist. What is condemned is using the new calendar, Paschal calendar. But the new calendar that we use in the Orthodox Church uses the old calendar, Paschal calendar, right? Which is why we, we have not only a different Easter to the Roman Catholics, on, on, you know, unless in, you have times that are in 2025 or they happen to coincide. This is also why we have different days on Ascension and Pentecost, right? This is because we use a different Paschal calendar. So we're not condemned by that council. We don't do that. We don't do that, right? At the very least, not now or anything like that. I don't think it's going to happen in the future. So that's the first thing I will, I will note is that there's no canonical basis for the initial separation. But then the reason became, oh, because you're ecumenist and your bishops preach heresy bareheaded, right? And they use uh, the first, second council that St. Photius presided, uh, Canon 15, about how it is valid to separate from communion from uh, bishops that teach heresy bareheaded. And they make it seem as if you're obligated to do that. And there's this kind of uh, mechanic behind it they have in their mind where if you have a bishop that is preaching heresy bareheaded, then he basically poisons 
the communion that, of the other bishops that he's a part of, right? So it's not just Patriarch Bartholomew that they will say is a problem. Well, the other bishops are in communion with Bartholomew is what they will argue. So you shouldn't be in communion with any of these churches. So there's two extreme positions. One of them say, well, the Orthodox Church still has grace. So they will recognize that we have grace. They will just say, we are, we should, we are not the true church. We should not be, you know, they, sh you know, they should basically fix. So that's kind of just a more of a moderate position. Then there's the extreme position that just says, oh, okay, the Orthodox Church doesn't even have uh, grace. They don't have any any kind of grace. They don't have any baptism, any Eucharist, anything of, the, of that sort. So the problem with this communal view is that it is ahistorical, right? Uh, there's many instances of bishops preaching heresy bareheaded where the other bishops were completely aware of it and they still remain in communion with them. Nestorius is an example of this. Another example I'd like to use, and this is an example I didn't use in this video, but I can I can use it in this stream, is actually 1054. Because until the 13th or 14th century, Alexandria was in communion with the Roman Catholic Church. Now, we will say the Roman Catholic Church were heretics, even you know after that time. Uh, will, will you say that the Patriarch of Alexandria was Roman Catholic, or would you say they were Orthodox, right? I mean, that's a, that's a question mark. We will, as Orthodox Christians, say that they were Orthodox Christians that was still in you know, still trying to hold on to the unity of the church and until, you know, really the Council of Florence, that kind of just went away, right? But that's that's a historical fact. And and it's it's a historical fact that challenges the ecclesiology of the so-called true orthodox position. So the true, or and, and the problem with, again, with Canon 15 of the First Second Council is that all it tells you is that if a, if a bishop is t preaching heresy bareheaded, you can separate communion with that bishop from that bishop and you don't get condemned as a result of it. But it doesn't say you have to do this, right? So the monks at Constantinople separated from communion with Nestorius. They didn't recognize him as a bishop, but there were many bishops in other parts of Christian world that were fully aware of what Nestorius was saying. Antioch straight up defended Nestorius for until 433. The Patriarch of Antioch straight up defended Nestorius. Everyone was in communion with Antioch too. And even they defended him even after the Third Ecumenical Council, right? Even after the ecclesial condemnation, they still defended him and the churches were still in communion with Antioch. So what does that mean? It just means that they were still part of the Orthodox Church. They were, their sacraments were still being recognized. They were still in communion with the rest of the Orthodox Churches. They were still part of the Orthodox Church. There was not a full-blown schism. And, and so the importance of maintaining communion in spite of these wrong things that happen, and, and a lot of people talk about this, is, is to preserve the unity of the church, right? This is what's important. So if you talk about like Moscow, Constantinople, one thing that we can talk about, although there's an Eucharistic separation, um, there's a recognition of sacraments from both sides, right? And this kind of preserves the unity of the church in that regard as well. So a lot of people have this Roman Catholic understanding of schism where like you're thrown out of the church and that's over, it's over, you know, you're gone, you're out, like completely, you're completely gone out. Whereas in the, in the Orthodox Church, it's, it's in degrees, right? And it's it moves over time, right? It progresses over time. So that's a vast difference between the two positions. And, and from my observation, the uh, so-called true Orthodox position is trying to maintain Orthodox ecclesiology with Roman Catholic presuppositions. I'm not saying they're Roman Catholic. Obviously, they're not trying to be Roman Catholic, but I do think they, whether they, they want to or not, have Roman Catholic presuppositions in their ecclesiology. Anything you want to add, Jay, before we move on to the next question? No, I mean, I think you, na you nailed it there. I mean, it's this attitude of like... Uh everything is sort of like a light switch like it just flips or like as soon as somebody says something heretical the light slip just switches switches flip and then everything is just the, the grace is shut off like some kind of machinery you know like <laughs> the electricity is no longer there and it's just kind of it's completely ahistorical and unrealistic when it comes to how the church operates in history there, there's a canonical procedure that, that occur like phases that occur for things like the excommunication of patriarchs and bishoprics and so forth. It's not this uh, overnight thing. It's, it's true that people have, uh, in, I mean, it's a case by case basis is what I'm trying to say. You can't like apply this one size fits all to where uh, the, the light switch goes out and then everybody's lost grace. It just doesn't make sense. It's in it. What it does is that it, it's realizing real problems, but then having a bad solution to real problems. And we don't see in church history saints setting up parallel ecclesiological uh you know structures parallel ecclesiological structures is what schism is so yeah precisely so um i can be you know i i'm sympathetic at the very least to 
the to your positions that still actually say you know you guys are still part of the true church it's just that this needs to be but there's very few of them that actually genuinely hold to that view and the ones that do end up becoming orthodox anyway that's kind of my observation both from the history of the church right we have a lot of saints that used to be old calendars and they became orthodox because they saw pretty much very similar things about the same things about the ecclesiological problems of this kind of position how it's really a dead-end position at the end of the day